Now, Greg Cosell of NFL Films is here. Normally, we would do this later in the afternoon, but Greg has been kind enough to accommodate my schedule today. Hey, buddy. I think we should overreact to everything that's going on. I think it's time to make definitive statements about everything. <laughs> I knew you'd appreciate that as much as anybody that I talked yeah. to, Greg, because it's just, it it seems it seems like it's an annual thing that we have to talk ourselves off the ledge or talk a fan base off the ledge about what their team is going through. And I'm just using the Bengals as an example. One and four start, tough to dig yourself out of that hole. But we would agree that the Bengals at least are a very good offense, if not a good team. Well, funny. It's funny that we're having this conversation right now because I'm watching the Bengals offense uh, as we speak. I mean, not actually as we're speaking, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and Joe Burrow is pretty good, by the way. Um, yeah. And it's funny talking about that as well. I, I actually saw because they we have TVs on in our area here. You've never been to my office, but we have TVs on in the area. And I was I stepped out the other day to, to go to the men's room and I saw on on, on some talk show you know, sports media talk show, do the Bills have a Josh Allen problem? And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> do you really want to have that conversation? You know, I watched that tape. He had a bad game. It was probably one of his worst games that he's had in quite a while. Putting aside the stats, the stats are just representative of the manner in which he played. But, you know, two weeks ago, he was. we were talking about him, people are, you know, as the MVP of the league, which, of course, is silly after three games as well. But now, all of a sudden, somebody's just having a debate as whether they have a Josh Allen problem. I think we need to kind of slow down a little bit. Let the season play a few more games. What do you think? I, uh, well, you know, as somebody who is one of these vultures and loudmouths, Greg, you know, I, I got to have a little reaction in the mix. Uh, oh, that's why we love you, Buck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, to your point, like, Josh Allen is the re is the, the the saving grace of the Bills offense. Like it's if anything, they should be talking about the wide receiver depth there because yeah. I think that Some was the first time that we you know it, yeah. it happens in the league. There's 17 games. It's really hard to be great for 17 games. Um, obviously, we tend to notice that more with with quarterbacks because they're the most visible player. But there's a lot of players, guys who we think who not we think who are really high level players in the league. You know what? They have bad games on occasion too. They're just not as visible as quarterbacks. Greg Cosell of NFL Films is here with us. Uh, we're doing a live version of the Install Podcast. It'll be available in your podcast feeds later. You can always go back and watch. Each episode on YouTube, normally we don't do it during the radio show, but Greg was uh, doing me a favor here today. So, uh, we're through five weeks, but four games for the local professional football team, Greg. Yeah. How do you, I guess, how would you assess them from a thousand foot view as they get ready to come out of this bye week and face their first uh, divisional opponent? Um. Yeah, I would say that under a new coaching staff, they're clearly a work in progress, which by the way, for someone like myself, who's been watching coaching tape since 1991 and has been with NFL films, you know, studying the NFL since 1979, I would say that to me, that's 100% expected. Um, I, I can go back and maybe there are some older listeners and I'm not making a direct comparison. I'm just talking about the way things play out and, and can play out over time. I remember when Joe Gibbs, was hired by the Washington Redskins. And his first season, they started off 0-5, okay? And everybody in Washington was saying, we got to fire this guy. This guy can't coach. And, you know, again, I'm not comparing um, Brian Callahan to Joe Gibbs. That's not my general point. I hope people understand that that's not what I'm saying. But, you know, I think sometimes when there's a new coach putting in a new scheme with younger players, uh, a quarterback who's not even started a 17 full season games, I think you have to let it develop. And I understand a fan base, believe me, I'm in the Philadelphia area. I certainly understand a passionate fan base. I get it. But you have to let it play out and develop. And, you know, I think that there's there's a wait and see aspect here. I, for one, I'm curious to see when they come out of the bye. Um, there won't be dramatic changes. You can't change. Look, They've been doing this since OTA started, which were what, Buck, back in, was it March or April, give or take? I yes, guess. sir. Yeah. They're not going to all of a sudden have dramatic changes because you can't do that. The, you know, the coaches can't handle that and the players can't handle that. So, you know, you're working on tweaks. You're working on getting better with execution. You're trying to clean up some of the mistakes, both individually and unit-wise. That's what you're trying to do. And you hope you come out with kind of a Christmas to, to the way in which you play and that uh, some of the mistakes are, uh, you know, alleviated and taken care of. 
you don't know that till they play. But, you know, I'm not one who's going to sit here and say, oh, my God, Will Levis, you know, God, he's made some mistakes. you got to get him out of there. That's just silly talk. And, and I think that's, you know, that's exactly how the coaching staff thinks. I think a lot of fans, at least looking at this upcoming game against the Colts, would say, all right, because he's he's got a sprained AC joint, Greg. We we haven't talked uh, since he was officially diagnosed. Is he going to play, or is that not known yet? Well, not known yet. I'm going to head out to practice today and see if he even throws, because I know he didn't throw during the bye. Right. And, and he may not play, but the point is, no matter what happens Sunday, even if they win with Mason Rudolph, to me, I don't even think there's any question of a quarterback controversy. Will Levis must play when healthy, and he must be given an opportunity to play enough games and get enough reps uh, to see what he is as an NFL quarterback. Having said that, as I think I've said to you before, that doesn't mean I think he's going to be a top five quarterback in the league. We don't know what he's going to be, but you have to give him the opportunity to find that out and to work through, um, you know, his his – what, what he's going through. Hey, just think of this. The interception he threw in the last game um, to Emmanuel Agba, I believe it was. Was yep. it not? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there's a quarterback named Aaron Rodgers who will be a first ballot Hall of Famer who threw the same interception to Andrew Van Ginkle this past week. Uh, so, you know, these things do happen. Sometimes the defense wins. Sometimes the defense fools. Even the, the smartest, most experienced quarterbacks in the league. These things do happen. So, you know, it's all a learning curve for Levis at this point. It, um, you're, and he's, I would imagine that, I don't want to say he's a difficult kind of coach, because that's, I don't want people to think Levis is, is a concern as an individual. But when someone is by nature so aggressive in their approach to the game, you have to channel that, and that can take time. Because the only way that can truly be channeled is by playing the game. You know, it, it's not going to help him channel it by sitting on the side with a clipboard or I guess with an iPad these days. But, you know, he has to play and he has to figure that out through experience. When can I do something? When should I not do something? Hey, in this situation, you know what? I can't take a sack no matter what. Even if I drop back and clearly I don't get a clear picture or no one's open. Hey, I can't take a sack in this situation. Hey, I have to check it down in this situation. I can't try to, to push it down the field. The only way to learn all those things, which are game management things, and that's not a negative term by any means, Buck, the game management element of quarterbacking is to play in those situations. Yeah, I, I mean, people would love for him to be a game manager here based on how this situation has gone. And there have been times when he's managed the situation, which makes those kind of maniac moments that he has or has had uh, all the more frustrating because you do see him making some progress. You do see him yep. kind of taking to some of the concepts that they've been trying to uh, to get through to them as an offense over the course of the last couple months. With that, Greg, uh, Gus Bar Bradley's defense, they are hemorrhaging yards right now. He has yeah. always played a certain style. If you could walk the audience through what that style is, just sure. as a refresher. Well, some might remember back, he was the original Legion, Legion of Boom coordinator with Seattle when he played almost all cover three because he had such good personnel that he didn't really have to change much. But Gus Bradley is a believer um, in playing, not doing a ton of things in other words doing a few things over and over and over so your players do them at a really high level that's his belief as a defensive coach so you're not necessarily going to get a lot of different looks a lot of different pressures you're going to get what you see on tape and that's what you're going to get um because he wants his players to play fast um, now, they're not going to have DeForest Buckner. He's still out with a sprained ankle. I think they're talking week seven at the earliest, so he won't play this week. Um, they've got a rookie who's playing at a really high level, Latu, um, who is the 15th pick in the draft, who was my number one edge player coming out, and he's played like that through the first early part of this season. They've got a linebacker, and I'm not speaking Zaire Franklin. I'm speaking EJ Speed, who's playing at a really, really high level. Um, their concern is at the corner position. And again, you hope you can take advantage of it. As you said, we don't know who the quarterback will be this week for Tennessee. Or but you side. hope you can, 
Yeah, correct. But you hope you could take advantage of the fact that Jones is the right corner. He was a late round pick. And for the most part, he's played solid football. He's a big kid. He's a little stiff. He's not a great athlete for the position, but he plays every snap. On the left side, they've kind of been rotating two guys, Womack and Flowers. Last week, Womack played the large majority of the snaps. Uh, Flowers actually made a mistake on the uh, Brian Thomas 70 some odd yard touchdown. Um, so maybe that was one reason he ended up not playing as many snaps, but they've sort of been in rotation at left corner. Um, I think they've got a solid safety position in Blackman and Cross. Cross, I think, can become a very good player. Player out of Maryland in his second or third year, I forget. Um, but I think he can become a good player. Um, they're a solid defense. They do what they do. Um, but they're not a great defense. The personnel is not good enough to be a great defense. But normally, there's no mystery to what Gus Bradley does normally. Uh, I want to stick with defense, but flip it to the Titans, Greg, because that you know statistically and counting stats mean whatever they mean, uh, d- depending right. on the context. They are the number one defense in terms of total defense. The offenses that they've faced have been suboptimal at best through these first four games. Uh, Play, I, playing the Dolphins helps with those stats early in the season. I mean, just brutal. But but with uh, with the left, how sustainable? What what do you see from the Titans' defense right now, Greg? Because they're doing it without a legitimate pass rush, and that makes me feel like it's going to be tough to kind of sustain that level of play when the offenses get better here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And at some point, you're going to need to be able to pressure the quarterback. And again, it's not number of sacks. I know a lot of fans just look at sack numbers. It's the ability to impact the quarterback. Um, You have to speed up the quarterback. Um, We'll see. I mean, Jeffrey Simmons, will he be back this week? Uh, he said he's going to be ready for the Colts, but I, he's got an elbow injury, Greg, that he's that's it's is UCL. And I don't I mean, if is that going to affect his ability to, you know, power and, and, I mean, and shed guess, blocks? Hey, you and I are not doctors. I guess we don't know the severity of it. That's no. the issue. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, and, and again, that could be an injury. He fights all year long and you hope he doesn't snap it or whatever it is that that requires surgery because that's a major surgery. Um, but anyway, um yeah, they, they haven't really shown that one player can be that dominant a pass rusher. That one player is someone that the offense has to account for in pure pass situations. You hope it, it'd be Landry. Um, you know, he's done that in the past. Uh, that's what you're hoping. But you're right. Um, is it sustainable? I mean, you could, the one thing about pass rush, Buck, you can always create pass rush. The big question becomes is how much do you want to sacrifice coverage in order to create pass rush? It's a numbers game. You can always add to your pass rush. If you don't feel you can get there with four and you want to rush five, you can do that. But now you're taking one out of your coverage so you're sacrificing and compromising your coverage because there's only so many coverages you can play if you have six in coverage versus seven in coverage so you know denard wilson certainly has a background of pressure because he was with greg williams with the jets as the db coach so greg williams had a a, a larger a, a plate of pass rush uh, concepts as any d coordinator in recent memory so denard wilson certainly has those in his playbook the question is does he feel comfortable doing that uh with you know with brownlee a rookie playing at one corner spot and i like brownlee a lot but he's still a rookie corner uh, of course, you can also watch Greg Cosell on the NFL Matchup Show on ESPN every Saturday before the games to get you ready. You can set your uh, DVR. You can watch it on demand on ESPN+. Plus. Uh, Greg, the two undefeated teams are off this week. Both the Chiefs and the Vikings have a bye. What, what piece in the Matchup Show do you want people to particularly pay attention to this week? Oh, boy. Let's see. Well, we're, we're, we're doing a piece, uh, the piece in, in our B block that Darius and I Darius Butler and I kind of do together, is, will this week be on, on Caleb Williams? Because I thought last week, I thought the last two weeks, I think the coaching staff has really done an outstanding job with him. Because you know, with a young quarterback, Buck, what you're really trying to do, and I'm not sure a lot of people think like this about young quarterbacks, is you're really trying to put him in a position where the player or players that he has to read on a given play are reduced so it's minimal. You know, you can't ask a quarterback to have to look at four or five defenders, even veteran quarterbacks. That's too much. So you're trying to 
based on probability and tendency of what you're expecting from a defense, understand with your route concept call that, okay, he only really has to read one defender. Maybe take a peek at a second one just to validate something, but you don't want to put a young quarterback in a position where he has to see too much because then you clutter his mind. He's not used to that. That's not what he had to do in college. So they did a really good job two weeks ago. And this week, I thought in particular, they did a great job with it. And he executed that at a really high level for the most part. And so we're going to deal with that in our B block. Um, I'm actually doing a piece on Jared Goff. And obviously, he was 18 for 18 in the last game. That's not going to happen every week, as we know. But the kinds of throws he makes from the pocket, window throws, which are really difficult throws in the NFL, uh, inside the numbers between defenders, of course, I'm talking zone coverage, he's as good as there is in the league at making those kinds of throws, and those are really difficult throws. Titans have the Lions coming up in a couple of weeks. That's going to be in Detroit, which uh, I've never done Ford Field. This is It's one of like the six stadiums I have left, Greg, and it, it feels like every game sounds like the Super yeah. Bowl in there right now. Well, I, I, and there was a Super Bowl there, and I was there, and I'm trying to remember which Super Bowl it was. Um, it was I think it's been open for quite a while, right? Ste- Jackson just said in my ear, Steelers Seahawks, maybe? Yes, yes. That was, so 2004, 2005-ish, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Might have been the Rolling Stones, the halftime show, if memory serves me correctly. Maybe Jackson could look that up. What's the, uh, Jackson, if you would, what's the best halftime show you've seen? Because you've gone to a fair amount of Super Bowls, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, of course, being an old guy, Buck, I'm, you know, more of a classic rocker. So those days are gone for halftime shows. (laughs) But back in the day, those, you had, you know, the Stones, you you had bands like that. So, you know, those were the ones I remember more than the recent ones because, you know, not that I don't like the music, but it's not the music I grew up with. You know, the music you grow up with, that that resonates with you more than, you know, more recent music that you hear, even if you like it. It's just, you know, the stuff when you're 13, 14, 15 stays with you, you know. A lot more because that's kind of, you know, it's what you grew up with. Absolutely. Uh, sources do confirm in my ear that it was, in fact, the Rolling Stones. That's Great. It. Can't believe I remember that. It was the Stones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that'd be a tough one to forget. That That's a that's a pretty memorable yeah, well, experience. Well, it's the Stones. I actually saw the Stones in Philly in 1980, a stadium show here in Philly. It was Journey, George Thorogood and the Destroyers and the Stones. Uh, I, I'm trying to imagine what you would be like at that concert and I'm, I'm enjoying the mental image that I, I we, well, we got to go, go to a show together next time you're in town. Maybe I when see, we do the I install see, live. I've seen a few concerts in my day like that, uh, Buck, you know, I, I would say so. Greg Cosell of NFL films hanging out there with us on 104.5 The Zone. Follow him at Greg Cosell on Twitter, the NFL matchup show on ESPN. Buddy, thanks for uh, stopping by. I appreciate it. All right, Buck, thanks. Appreciate it. Have a great one. That is the main man, Greg Cosell of...